How's it going? And welcome to episode 81 of On The Wire, proud member of the Picture List Podcast Network. Follow the pod on the Twitter at On The Wire Pod. And of course, if you're listening on a platform that allows ratings and reviews, please take a second to let us know what you think. I am Adam Howe. You can follow me on the Twitter at 80 grade. That's all spelled out. And I am once again joined by Kevin Hastings, who should be followed on the Twitter at Hastings Kevin. And we are officially heading into 2023, Kevin. It was a nice little uh, week off, I get in a sense, as we put together our like 2022 clip show, which was fun to listen to. But now we're, we're steaming ahead toward the next season. And how many drafts have you already completed? <laughs> I haven't completed any. Oh, okay. I am currently a draft that we'll talk about here in a little bit, a best ball draft. I am currently in a first year player draft mock here at, on, on pitcher list with some of the other uh, pitcher list folks here that mainly the dynasty and prospect crew. So that's a lot of fun. We'll probably wind that up today. But I have resisted the urge to jump into too much yet, but it's not going to be much longer. I know these best balls are smart as getting them going one after the other, keeping two at a time going so far. And it sounds like that's his plan moving forward here for a little bit early in draft season. And of course, the NFBC draft champions leagues are up and running it was really hard not to already be <laughs> in was. one of those, but I'm holding out just a little bit longer. Yeah, that was, I saw that flipped over the day after the regular season started pretty much. And they filled up pretty quick. The, uh, the two hour and the four hour, and I think there was a one hour clock yeah. in there as well. So all three of those filled up pretty quick. They've got the, uh, they've got the draft boards through the first six rounds over at the NFBC Twitter account. So if you're l- looking for some very early ADP data <laughs> that you're going to find the first six rounds for those two le- or two of those leagues posted up there. Yeah, it was hard to not jump in there. I'm, I'm doing the pitcher list overall two early mocks, if you will. I think we can use that term now because Justin Mason hasn't done those, I think, in a, o- over a year now. So anyway, that's been fun. But at the same time, Derek, who I'll introduce in a second, and I were talking before, and it's just a lot of shots in the dark (laughs) at this point, unless you've done the amount of research that maybe others have done right here. Right now we are going to talk about that draft that you said you were in with our very special guest returning to the show, Derek Rhodes. He joined us last off season, focusing on injury concerns with a little bit of talk about best balls. This time around, we're going to focus specifically on that specialty and that's drafting best ball leagues, which you two are, have been, participating in at least one of them as we talked about Derek should be followed on the Twitter at J a G underscore fantasy for baseball and fantasy insights. He can also be followed at D R H O a three on the Twitter for more injury data visualizations. He puts together for baseball prospectus as well as just a really interesting and fun way of looking at different, uh, different data. Derek finished last season third best overall in the Earth Fantasy Baseball League, which Kevin and I are also part of. Congratulations, Derek, on beating both of us pretty handedly in that. (laughs) He did win the Salarf chapter, which is the first season of his existence as he he left the Glarf, started off Slarf. I just want to say all these ARF names as as much Mm -hmm. as possible. Mm -hmm. So congratulations on that accomplishment, Derek, and welcome back to the show. I appreciate that as a kind intro. It was a nice way to start off Slarf as the first champion. Mm -hmm. And for the folks at home, do not Google Slarf. Just if I could give a tip. We found out later that uh, it's not just a fun name. You realize when you tell people not to do that, they will. People are typing right now. They've been, this podcast has been paused. (laughs) They've gone over to Google and they're doing it right now. I can't be held responsible. Once you've been warned, that's on you. We put the warning <laughs> label on it. Like now you can be adults and make the decision for yourselves. <laughs> if you want that in your search history, but right. may, maybe at least put <laughs> in the incognito, incognito mode. Yep. Yeah. Definitely Get the incognito. VPN, whatever you need to do. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> Not at work, folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you do you guys, whatever, whatever, whatever you want. I have not searched for Slurf on Google. I usually just look. You're winning. 
Yeah, yeah that's good. I'm winning. I'm winning at life, and I'm going to continue just with that streak for now. We'll. See. I'll let you know. I'll let you all know if I ever succumb to the interest levels that it would be needed to actually put that into my search bar. Welcome back, Derek. Thank you for taking the time. We are going to talk a bit about best balls, as we alluded to a little bit earlier. We are going to start off though with a couple of pieces of news. There's going to be obviously lots of news to talk about throughout the off season. Not much or all of it early on is going to be as fantasy relevant. It's more signings and how that it'll affect who's being cut or who's not, who's opting out of their contracts and all that. But there are two pieces of information that I saw come across the news desk that I would be interested to get your guys' take on. And I do believe there is some fantasy relevance, especially as you're drafting early on in these draft and holds and these best balls and you're taking these darts. So these are things I think that need to be taking into account when you are throwing these darts. Kevin, I'm going to start with you on this one. It's partially playoff related, partially future related. The Yankees, they are going to be without two or they have been without two pretty big bullpen arms during the ALDS matchup with Earl this Chapman being left off the roster as part of some disciplinary measures. And then Scott Efros being left off with an elbow issue that ultimately is leading to him having to have Tommy John surgery. I think it's common knowledge at this point that Chapman probably isn't going to be in pinstripes come 2023. So I'll be interested to see where he goes and what kind of role he can actually drum up. But I also think Efros might have been, might have had a shot at least to move into a more prominent role for the Yankees bullpen, possibly even closer at some point. So my question is, if you're drafting now, who do you expect to be the Yankees closer and how confident would you be that they are actually on the New York roster at this very moment? Oh, I don't have any confidence at all. This is a tough one, actually. I think that the general consensus would probably lean towards Clay Holmes. And that's a good possibility. I think that the fact that you brought up at the end of the question that the, their closer for next season isn't currently on the roster is a great possibility. And Derek and I, in, in this draft we're going to talk about is not quite finished up. We're in the 36th round, but I am coming up here pretty quickly. And I believe I get two picks before Derek gets to pick again. But I'm, and it's funny, we'll get into some of the strategies of these best balls in a little bit, but some of these guys, speculative closers that we would be all about at this portion of a draft and hold draft don't have the same value in these best balls. If you're not getting wins and you're not getting saves and you're not getting a lot of innings, if you're in my lineup for a week in a best ball format, a lot went wrong and it's nice to get a couple of positive points. They do add up over time, but you can't have too many of these guys at the same time. If you hit, they can be very valuable. So I think we forgot. It seems like the season started yesterday and now we're in the postseason. at the same time. It feels like years ago that, that Michael King was one of the best relievers in baseball. And we just found out in the last couple of days, he is not having Tommy John's surgery. And it sounds like he will be ready for spring training. I have him lined up in my queue right now with the shot that he could be the guy in New York as well. But to really answer your question in general, yeah, I don't have any confidence at all in knowing who their 2023 guy will be. Derek, do you have any other thoughts on the New York bullpen? Because you're considering these drafts that were taking place right now? I don't know if I would do any anything different than what Kevin said. I think when you look at a bullpen like the Yankees, I think this is the way, if you're going to speculate in best ball, and I don't know that I would recommend that, but if you were going to, you should speculate on good pitchers. So instead of trying to pick who you think is going to be, quote unquote, the closer, pick the best pitcher. And then at the very least, you have an outside. So in this case, to me, it's Michael King, right? If I'm drafting one guy in that, now obviously there's some injury things, but if you just set aside the injury stuff for a minute, Michael King would be the guy I would pick out of this bullpen because I look and go, I think this is the guy who at the very least is going to get the most Ks in this bullpen, even if he doesn't end up getting the most saves. Yeah, he's shown that when he does go, he goes multiple innings, can rack up not only mm -hmm. the Ks, but he can vulture those wins. Like you said, with those in that point format in those best balls, it makes a lot more sense to be going after a more guaranteed or at least somebody who's going to put themselves in a position to get those guaranteed points and not 
as you said, not recommend speculating as much. Bullpen's obviously something that will continue to evolve throughout the offseason. Most, many of the bullpens in the AL East, it seems, with Heim Bloom also mentioning he'll be going after some bullpen help in the offseason, seems to be in flux. So something to keep an eye out. All right, Derek, last note here I'm going to talk about, get your take on this first, is that Atlanta does it again. As everybody says, they lock up another young phenom with Spencer Strider signing a new contract that keeps him on the team through the 2028 season, basically just effectively buying out his arbitration seasons. And at least one more after that, there's a team option on top of that as well. When you see these types of contracts for young guys as Atlanta tends to has been doing, and they're not the only team, they've just been doing a lot of them in the last year and a half. Does it provide any added confidence in those players when you're drafting them, especially early on in draft season? I think it provides more confidence for guys who haven't shown something elite at the major league level. Like when you get a guy like Spencer Strider, we didn't need the contract to know, oh man, this guy, he might be good. Like we might want to draft him. <laughs> I think I'm more in, I think my opinion of a player changes more when this is signed before guys in the majors or after limited uh, exposure in the majors because then it's okay. There's no reason to hold him back. We're just going to lean in and let him go. If the Braves were going to hold Spencer Strider back, like that would have been, that would have been pretty, a pretty unimpressive move and pretty surprising. So for me, it doesn't change a lot. And then I know some people want to say, well, maybe that means we should be confident in the health. And I think that's probably a mistake for pitchers. Just assume he's just an average level of health for a pitcher, which probably means at some point an injury, but nothing to worry about. But I don't think we should read into this and go, oh man, then I'm more confident in this guy's ability to continue playing or anything like that. It's personal, personally. Yeah, it's tough. You, what I took out of that r- real quick was I heard you say, like it gives you confidence in the player hasn't made it to the majors yet or hasn't shown anything yet. Mm-hmm. And then the unfortunately in that scenario, the names that stick, the names that come to mind are like Scott Kingery. And it's like, <laughs> it doesn't work out necessarily. Right? Yeah. But that's where, that's the connection that I make yeah. in that scenario. Yeah. The, on the opposite side, I think, the name that rings a bell for me is Aaron Ashby. Obviously a big name for not only for myself, for a lot of people in draft circles. Last season, going into last year, did not provide the top end ceiling that we would have liked to have seen. But the Brewers did lock him in regardless of that production or lack thereof in the same way that Atlanta did with Spencer Strider. So personally, I get more confidence in the pitchers when they do lock up a pitcher that they're going to have a role if they didn't already have that role. So obviously Strider, right. maybe not the best example because he already earned that role long before he signed that contract extension. But guys like Ashby or anybody else that yeah. might sign that kind of sign through arbitration, mm-hmm. I know that they're either going to be in that rotation or they're going to have a prominent role. On the positional side, yeah, I was all about the Scott Kingeries when he signed that you know, went for exactly like you said. He's going to have that role. He's going to play, quote, every day. They're paying him. It's like what we say about closers. It's regardless, Liam Hendricks is always going to be the closer for the White Sox because he's getting paid right. to, to be the closer. Kevin, do you have any other opposing viewpoints on that? Or is there another player that comes to mind? Oh, the player, the first time I read this on the outline, I was in general, yeah, a slight bit of confidence. I think that in general, the team thinks, okay, this guy has a role or they wouldn't be doing it. But then I think Evan White is the first guy that popped in. Yep, my head. that's one that comes <laughs> to my mind too, Kevin. Yes. Yeah, and, that and one hurt. <laughs> like, we're three seasons in. Granted, the first season was the short in 2020. He played 54 of 60 games and we haven't really seen him since. He's three years into a six-year contract and we're probably not going to see him the way things look. That's the name that comes to my mind. So there is some hesitation, but I think in general, it, it does give me, it's especially uh, as Derek said, when we're talking prospects that we haven't seen at the major league level yet, it, it gives me confidence. We're going to see them sooner rather than later, at least get an opportunity. I think opportunity is what you're confident about. Not that they will be good and not that they, or bad. It's that when you invest that kind of money that the player's going to get an opportunity. And for best ball, that's actually a big part of what you're buying is opportunities. You're trying to draft players who have that. Your volume wins out over most in both the best balls and in, in the draft, in those draft and hold formats as well. All right, guys, that, that's pretty much going to do it for our news and notes. I'm sure that'll expand throughout the season. We'll have a couple more things to talk about, but we're going to get into our main discussion of the episode. And that is talking about drafting best balls with Derek. And that is Derek's specialty as he 
told me off air over a hundred leagues last year. So lots of data points just getting started. But before we do that, we are going to take this quick break. All right. And we are back. Of course, you are listening to On The Wire. I am Adam Howe, joined as always with Kevin Hasting and our special guest today, Derek Rhodes, will be talking long about best balls. This is usually the most the most draft board, I think, on Twitter at this stage of the game is either going to be a best ball draft board or possibly a, a DC or draft and hold style. So we're going to focus today, though, on best balls. And Derek, what I want to ask you, though, is I don't play a lot of best balls. The only best balls or best ball like format that I play on a regular basis is Raz Slam, which still mm-hmm. has some fab component to it. It's more like cut line on the NFBC platform. So uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is really quickly sell me on the format. Why should I be doing more of these as opposed to just waiting it out? What benefits are there to doing this kind of format? And you exclusively do best ball formats. So if there's anybody that's going to, you know, that that's in love with the format, it's you and you should be able to sell me on this a little bit better. Absolutely. I think the biggest selling point is all the fun of the draft without any of the consequences during the summertime. <laughs> I do play almost exclusively best ball. I do my Slarf is the only sure. non best ball league that I did this year. And, and you won it for me. <laughs> I did win. And I did win. I would call that luck. I, <laughs> I maybe should quit playing non best ball at this point now. But <laughs> the big thing is just you don't have to manage it. It's just teams that like people love in general. I think people really enjoy the draft. That's our that's the part that we really we can just argue about. It's all the promise before a season has started. Everybody's draft looks good when it happens. <laughs> and then you get to have all that joy. And then if it's a train wreck, you don't have to like deal with it. You don't have to try and fix it. It's done. And so that that's what it is for me. I, I do these, I do a lot of leagues. I do about a hundred leagues, but I'm actually less busy during the season sure. than I am during the off season, which works well since injuries is what I do during the season. I'm pretty busy with that. And so being able to do, to do it this way works really well for me. And there's, and the other thing I would say is price points. There are best balls that are as cheap as $10. And if you're somebody who's, I want to have a little skin in a game or something, but I don't want to feel pressure or stress about how much money I have on a game, then I think that's really nice. Yeah. And you have a nice little one sheet over on your site. If you check, I'll have a link to that in the show description as well. But at do you pronounce it Jag or do you just say I do Jag? Okay, yeah, no, all right. I pronounce it Jag. Yes. No, that's no, good right. clarity. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. So at jagfantasysports.com, there's a I think it's right there. There's also your pinned tweet on your Twitter as well. You're simply the best ball guide. It's a nice little, I guess, two sheet technique or back and front. Mm-hmm. But uh, once you can you give me a synopsis of that sheet verbally, yeah. and then people can go and take a look at it after the fact about like where to play, how to play, sure. and how to get into it. Absolutely. So my goal was just for people, because it's not the most common, I think, in baseball. And so I was just trying to intro. And so what it does is it walks through the two most popular best ball options that are out there. Fantrax runs a lot of best ball. And then the NFBC, as well as under their umbrella, is the BB10 product. They are the two main options for best ball. And so this just runs through the scoring difference, the different price points, the There's a good amount of variation between Fantrax and the NFBC. The NFBC plays a lot closer to Roto in its point scoring. If you're completely new to best ball, I guess I should have said this. Best ball is points. It's all points. It you draft and then throughout the league, throughout the year, the computer sets your best lineup based on what you've drafted. So every week it sets the best lineup for that week, taking the players that you've drafted. They Every site has different roster requirements and have a pretty deep bench. The drafts are anywhere between 34 rounds to 45 rounds generally, depending on which format you're in. So they're pretty deep leagues, but I just walked through the kind of the differences, how one point system favors certain types of players. For instance, as I said, the NFBC is more of a roto mindset. So they tried to mimic their points closer to what you would see from five by five. So steals are more valuable on that platform. Saves are more valuable on that platform relative to fan tracks, which actually has more of an OBP centric uh, OBP power, and then a volume pitching focus with their point scoring. They use quality starts as a staff, as a, for instance, I break down that sheet really is helpful. So you can see those differences. I have a couple examples about players who play up on one format and down on another format and things like that. So that kind of breaks that down because if you come in not knowing, you can really be at a disadvantage if the other folks in the league have some idea of these differences. 
Kevin, you're do you guys we're gonna talk about your guys' draft in a little bit, but so you're doing this best ball draft as well with Derek. Do you find yourself compartmentalizing your formats when you're drafting? This, this would be my fear. It, getting into these best balls, I wouldn't want to stop drafting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> as Derek, as you put it, it's like all the fun of drafting and not, and not having to worry about it the rest of the regular season. But then I would be worried that I would end up intermingling my best ball drafts with my draft and holds. And then later on in the later on draft season with Fab as well, I already have concerns mixing and matching my draft and holds with my Fab leagues, never mind best balls, which are, as Derek pointed out, point league. Is that do you think that fear is unfounded or would you do you have that same kind of mentality where you'll stop drafting best ball leagues at a certain point and then move on to a different format? No, typically I, your concern, I understand completely, but I think that is an advantage. There's a lot of people out there doing a lot of these best ball drafts and you can tell who aren't those people. Typically, you can tell by some of their draft picks. I highly recommend no matter what format you're doing, just plug the scoring into an auction calculator. We're not doing an auction, but plug the scoring into an auction calculator. There are some big swings that you wouldn't think of right off the top of your head. And I make sure to do that before I'm doing any draft. Even we've been drafting Roto Leagues for many years now, and I still make sure everything is exact dependent on the league format, just to make sure there's not anything that's going to be drastically different that I wouldn't think of. So the concern is there. Just be careful. Make sure that you're not falling into that trap. And then it is an advantage. There's going to be a few people in every one of these leagues that that you draft that probably haven't separated it that way. I would say it's more challenging for people who do field based drafting, who they they have their rankings. Cause I think a lot of people, when they make rankings per se, they make them based on Roto, like a five by five Roto mentality. And it's hard to mentally translate that on the fly to a best ball. I think the people who can easily more easily transition are people who use more of a road like an auction calculator like kevin said or some type of formula to get a rough idea of their valuations because that helps the differences between the formats jump out and it actually helps you make the transition because you don't have to mentally think about the different kinds of players the valuation itself will help you get into the right space. So I think that the people I see struggle are people who have more of a feel based drafting. And I don't want, I don't mean that in a negative because I think that's can be very successful. I just mean, I think it's harder to translate that to a completely different format. Yeah. I can be like drafting numbers and not names for the most part. If you can actually do that auction calculator, you get you talking about and then black out all the names on the left column and just draft based on what you're seeing those valuations. I mean, that that advice could be used for pretty much any format. So who, are you drafting this guy on name or are you drafting him on production? I and mean, a lot of times you'll see a, a guy get drafted and you'll be like, everybody knows he's not actually that good anymore, right? You're just drafting him based on the name value. And it sounds like that's even to the nth degree when you're trying to, when you're like Derek, you said you're drafting for feel in a best ball rather than adjusting your mindset to knowing where you are and what you're mm-hmm. supposed, what you should be doing. I can't believe I have to, I'm, I can't believe I'm drafting this guy over, but I, but it doesn't make any sense not to. That's what I'm gathering out of that as well. Kevin, I think you probably see this in every draft where the pitching is the big culture shock for people. Like you, there's always somebody who's like their first best ball and they're like, I don't understand why pitching is going so early. And especially at fan tracks, like pitching is aggressive, more aggressive than any league you probably drafted because of the way the format benefits those high end elite pitchers. And so like those guys go a lot earlier and you always catch somebody who's not done the format before when they're just surprised by that. Yeah, I think I was one of those people. I saw your guys' draft board and I saw that Alcantara went 1-1 and I'm like, wow, okay, that is that that is interesting. That is something that I'm going to have. Maybe the only time that happens, though. Yeah, exactly. I, just like, like, I, I don't the know that that will happen draft a lot. in October. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Before the awards are given out, too. That's a good right. Yes. Yep. Let me see if you guys have, uh, let's compare overall strategy then. Derek, I'll start with you obviously here, Mm -hmm. but what would you recommend your overall strategy be going into these best balls? And I know it it does matter which platform you're playing. And as you mentioned, the point system and the position eligibility is different between the NFBC and Fantrax. 
but I guess in general, and if you want to specify, mm-hmm. I would do this here, but I wouldn't do it on another one. That's fine as well. What would you recommend be the overall mindset that you'd go into one of these drafts? Yeah, I'll speak to fan tracks mostly. There, there are people who are quite frankly more experts on the NFBC, especially the cut line format and that and some of their best ball than I am. And so I'll speak to fan tracks where I feel a little more confident in my expertise. And that what I would say is you're going to push pitching up more than you're comfortable. You need to make sure you have both depth and quality. So you can't just load up at the back end. You have to have some quality guys who are going to give you length. You need to make sure you have well-rounded coverage from all your player position players. So, you know, it's a 40 person or it's a 40 round draft. And so when you're rostering, you're thinking about roster construction, you need to have 16 to 17 pitchers. And then that means that you have 23 spots that you can assign to the other players. And so you need to think through that where you want to try and have multiple backups at every position and things like that. And so you really have to math backwards into what you want your roster to look like. And then you have to keep that in mind as you're drafting, because as you're going along, you're going to get this point where it's like, oh, I've only, I've only rostered 14 pitchers, but I still have backup hitters that I need to do. So you just have to keep that in mind best ball is volume based. So you want good players, but more than anything, you can't afford to have players who aren't going to play. It can push elite prospects down a little bit, not off the draft board completely, but just down because there's that risk that you could have a couple months where they're not playing. And on a draft and hold, that's not a big deal, especially if the first part of the year, but for a best ball, you don't want to have any, any time when a player is zero on your roster. It's another injuries is another thing you can be less aggressive with because those zeros can really hurt you. So I would say those are the big things. And the mistakes I see a lot are people who are not thinking about the downside risk of a player on a team where you can't make any ad drops and things like that, that can get you in trouble. Kevin, do you have any other general, like, like when I'm going into a best ball draft, I'm going to make sure I put together my roster in such a way, or yeah, do you have, do you stray away from anything that Derek mentioned? No, I agree with everything Derek just said. I have gotten to the point it worked out pretty well for me last season in the couple of best ball leagues that I did do. I don't necessarily go super early on pitching, but when Derek said you can't save them all for the back end, I agree with that a hundred percent. I went hitter heavy and ended up taking pitchers in rounds four through six. And then I ended up with only those three pitchers through 10 rounds. And the first one being in the fourth round, But then eight of my next nine picks were pitchers. I didn't wait till the very end because I I think the there, as Derek said, there has to be some quality to your depth. So I make my run on pitching in the first half of the draft, not necessarily at the top anymore. I used to that there's at least one player in this draft. Their first three picks were pitchers. That's the way I used to do it. I found that I didn't score well on the hitting side, but I still don't want to wait too long on the pitching. And I definitely, once I catch up in the number of pitchers I'm rostering it towards the later portion of the first half of the draft, I'm not just going to catch up. I'm going to go ahead of everybody else and try to get more quality depth than they have. The one question I have for both of you guys is, let me know if this is like a fallacy or if this is something that's just not actually true, but especially with pitchers. I remember a couple of years ago, I did draft a best ball and I drafted like Herman Marquez. And it, I also think Robbie Ray in that same draft and I got some flack for it. But then I also had other people in my ear saying, no, these guys are better in a best ball format because when they do poorly, it doesn't hurt you because more than likely somebody else on your bench did just enough more that you don't, you only get the good, you don't get the bad. Would either one of you guys say that is true? Like you will draft guys based on that fact? Is it still like you don't want to take those bad weeks? I think you can draft those guys. I think that it, you just need to make sure you don't overvalue them because I think if you overvalue them, then it's not that you're just, it's not that you're taking them ahead of where they would be in another draft. It's almost, you don't want to go, Hey, because I'm going to get the good weeks, they're even better. It's no, it's just, they don't drop quite as far because you get those good weeks, but the bad weeks still mean you can't use them. So that's a dead roster spot for that week. So that's not necessarily a good thing. All right. That's good to, that's a good mentality to have in general. Like just knowing that if I'm going into a best ball, knowing the valuation on players is going to 
in a lot of in a lot of cases is going to be drastically different than in a standard roto or five by five. Even in a head to head, we talk about the differences in the roto versus head to head valuations, and just knowing that you can feel comfortable drafting a guy four rounds ahead of where you would feel comfortable doing it in a in a roto standard league, just because the valuation, the points difference, and everything else it's putting into account. So I guess I'll just echo what you guys have both said. Utilize those auction calculators. At least this is my takeaway. Utilize those auction calculators and sure, manipulate what you think the players are going to do, especially pre, none of the projections are out now. You've got to put together your own expectations statistically, Mm -hmm. but kind of trust the valuation based on the point system that you're plugging into that auction calculator. I think most of us realize that that fan graphs one, just because you can manipulate the points structure pretty easily on that. Yeah. The other thing, like when you mentioned Herman Marquez specifically, some of these guys, maybe not necessarily a pitcher for the Rockies, but maybe other National League West pitchers that you know are going to end up pitching in Coors a couple times throughout the year, that I'm more apt to take them in a best ball draft. And it's not missing the bad starts. How frustrating is it throughout the season when we put a good pitcher on our bench because he's going to Coors <laughs> and then he goes there and shoves? We still get credit for those outings. Sure. That's a big thing. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and then, yeah, the same thing could be true on the hitting side when you get a very streaky hitter and you sit him because he's facing three lefties in the week or something like that. And somehow the reverse splits work out and you lose out on those two home runs. So, yeah, I get what you're saying on that. All right, let's talk about some of these players. There's two things I want to talk about here. And that is you know, overall, it, we're talking about some targets and some avoids that in this format. And Derek, you put out a pretty interesting tweet the other day. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, not gonna, I copied and pasted it here, but it's way too long. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna <laughs> talk about it specifically. But basically, it sounds like you took players that were drafted in S balls on the NFBC platform, and you want to compare if you drafted this player, you did X amount better than the teams that did not draft this player on an individual yeah. player basis, and then the reverse would be true as well. And players that did not draft this player, et cetera, et cetera. What were you, I guess, what were the results? And if you go follow Derek on Twitter, you can find at least the top couple results as people were guessing, but like ultimately what did you find from crunching those numbers? So what I was trying to come up with is the idea is, Hey, how much does one player matter and which players are the ones that matter the most, both positively or negatively. So I'm looking at average scores of the teams that either did or didn't have that player. And so my thought process is maybe this can help narrow down on the type of players that, that are, that can lead to success and the type of players that you need to think about avoiding. And it did some of that. It alluded to some things. Now this was for the NFBC format, the best balls, they're 12 teams and they're between 45 and 50 players deep. So it doesn't include their cut line format. And they had about 75 of those leagues. And what I found is that the player that was the most beneficial, if you included, as long as you eliminated small samples. So I basically, hey, a guy had to be in at least drafted in at least half the leagues or something like that. Because actually Spencer Strider was a right. huge one, <laughs> but he was only drafted in a handful of leagues in that format because of the uncertain playing time. Shohei Otani was the most, by this one metric, which is certainly isn't all-inclusive, the most valuable player, like one player that made a difference in scoring for a team. He was a positive 633 points for the teams that drafted him on average over the teams that didn't draft him on average. Now, that is not maybe too shocking on the NFBC because there he is like a cheat code because they wait until the end of the week to decide if he's better served for your team as a pitcher or a hitter. Unlike when in a roto format, we have to decide early in the week, you get to wait to see what happens. And then whatever he would benefit you most as that's what he goes. It really is. It's like an added roster spot for best ball. It's it, it solidified him as being a 1.1 player for this format, at least from a valuation standpoint. Then on the flip side, the most negative player, the player that had that was single-handedly was the biggest difference in scoring was Fernando Tatis Jr., which again makes sense, right? Highly a player drafted pretty high. So your opportunity cost, if you drafted him, you didn't get to draft somebody else who was a very good player. And he played not at all, right? So uh, you took a zero for uh, at a position that most people probably got 500, 600 points. So he was at the, on average, he cost his teams about 578 points. 
I think that's a really fun way to look at it. And like Adam said, go check out the the thread because there's a lot of discussion about the types of players who are who are more beneficial or less beneficial. Yeah, you said like Otani gives you oh, gave a team 633 more points than if you didn't draft him. And then mm-hmm. the example you gave in your original tweet though is like Tony Kemp. He averaged 469 more points. So right. in general, that's still a lot of points. And this is Tony right. Kemp we're talking about, yeah. not Shohei Otani. Which, by the way, I just make it official. Derek just named Shohei Otani the MVP. Sorry, Aaron Judge. I'm just going to make sure I get that <laughs> out there. We all heard it, and it's recorded. But uh, I'm committed. Yeah, exactly. So it was interesting to to see the obvious. I think the Fernand Tatis Jr. Ob- it was a pretty obvious one. It, people right. didn't get it right away, but it was pretty obvious just to the fact that, yeah, you drafted him in the fir- probably the first round in most cases, and he played zero games. As you mentioned, mm-hmm. you want to avoid <laughs> taking zeros pretty much at every point in the draft, especially right. your first two rounds, two round picks. Does any of this surprise you, Kevin? Does this kind of information in a general sense, sway your overall strategy when drafting best balls in general, or is it all seem pretty, yeah, exactly what you expected? It's pretty much what I expected. There, there's always a couple names that, that surprise you a little bit. And you, like Derek said, then you go look at that type of player, not just that specific player. And Otani brings up a good point as well when we're looking at different formats not only is it the pitcher slash hitter split for Otani in the f- fan tracks version of these best ball formats, there's no multi-positional eligibility there. Right. The players that are assigned one position and those will not change from now until the end of next season. So it's something to keep in mind when you're looking at NFBC formats where you do get the multi-positional eligibility that drastically increases the value of those types of players. And did they in the NFBC, they gain eligibility throughout the season as well. Yes. Fan tracks, like yeah. you mentioned, they mm-hmm. like Otani is an outfielder in fan tracks. It's the only place you'll find Otani as an outfielder. Yep. <laughs> but he's an outfielder, and even if he starts playing first base, he doesn't gain first base eligibility. That's but in NFBC, if he were to actually start playing in the outfield, he could be he could become outfield eligible on top of pitching. He obviously already has the UT eligibility. Yeah. And then one more thing, Adam, just you were talking about Tony Kemp being an odd. And I, and I picked him because I was like, nobody will guess Tony Kemp for anything, plus or minus. So I was like, <laughs> this is just a, it won't give away the farm. But a player like Tony Kemp being on this list is probably more about the people who drafted him and the types of players and managers who are like, this player makes sense on my roster as opposed to the player itself. And so then you go, okay, what about him as a player was interesting to, to, to a drafter who often scored higher than player than other people. So it's more, that, that's almost a testament to the quality of the drafter as much as it is the player, because Tony Kemp did not score that many points this year, <laughs> but he was uh, eligible at second base and outfield. He had consistent playing time. He is a stolen base threat, which in the NFBC format, which favors more of a roto scoring is more relevant. And he didn't have a lot of threats. Like he was probably going to have a job most of the year. And so like, then you think, okay, how do I translate that to a strategy? And that I think is a takeaway that's worth having, even if I would not necessarily to say Tony Kemp is the guy. Yeah, there were definitely, there were multiple players on the A's that I was targeting in early drafts last year, just on that one note that they're going to play. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like I had Elvis Andrews on a lot of teams, Luckily, toward the end of the year, that kind of panned that out. out. Yeah, that worked out. <laughs> Finally, it took a couple months, but it worked out nicely. But the volume was always going to be there. Tony Kemp was another example. And there are plenty of other A's players that kind of fit that mold just because the A's have zero dollars <laughs> guaranteed on their contract yeah. going into the going right now at this very moment until they actually offer arbitration. They have zero dollars committed across the board. So it's like the same, players. The, same. Yeah. <laughs> Players that were going to be on the roster, we're going to play. All right. Let's get into let's get into this draft, you guys. And we won't get into round by round. We don't have that kind of time <laughs> at this point. And you guys are still drafting. But what I'm curious to know about are utilizing the strategies that you guys talked about earlier in the show and the fact that we're on the fan tracks format and this is a best ball style league. I want to talk about some of the guys that you guys drafted that you don't expect to draft at least at the spot you drafted them at in a standard five by five. So for you, for, 
for Kevin, it's a whole bunch of other leagues. Derek, this slurf. Like these are guys just the one. <laughs> not, just the guys one. you're probably not going to get at that spot come March in that one league that you're going to continue to do. Hopefully you are going to do it again and defend your yes. crown. That would be kind of weird. You're like, no, I'm going out on top. Going out on top. Sorry. See you guys. So I want you guys to give me a player that you guys targeted in this best ball draft well before you would have to target them in a standard format, five by five, what have you. As a reminder, this draft you guys did, it was on Fantrax. It's 12 teams. So Fantrax points system, individual positions, as we talked about. And yeah, there's money on the line here, but ultimately that's, I don't think that's playing that much of a role in your strategy. Derek, give me a guy that, again, you got, you got in this draft that you think you wouldn't have to pay up as much in a regular draft. Yeah. So I've got two, one that I drafted and one that somebody else drafted. So the one that somebody else drafted, which I think this is a great example, especially if you compare it to a Roto is Kyle Schwarber. Kyle Schwarber went in the fourth round, the first pick of the fourth round in this league. His batting average does not mean anything in this league. You get all the benefit of his power, his on-base ability, the counting stats, and none of the negative of the batting average that you would have to deal with in a Roto league. So he's a perfect kind of player who's like incredibly valuable in this format. And then the player that I drafted higher that I would probably expect to go lower would have been Martin Perez. So it's a 12, 12 person league and I drafted him in the 14th, first pick, second pick of the 14th round. And it's just a volume play because of the way that best ball rewards volume in a way that Roto not getting the K's would be a problem. And obviously the risk of being on a bad team and not getting as many wins and things like that are all negatives. They're not as big a negatives in this format. And even then that's probably earlier than I would have expected him to go, but (laughs) you're still trying to figure out where these guys are going to end up. Yeah. We were talking about, yeah, before we started recording, it's like a lot of these drafts are just data collection, right? It's just like trying to get as much information as you go along into draft season, Mm -hmm. rather than just relying on ADPs. We'll talk about it once ADPs are actually start getting announced as more and more drafts get collected in. But it is one thing to look at that list. And it's another thing to be involved and be in the draft and kind of feel why that player was picked at that point, roster construction and all that. Kevin, do you have another player that you feel as though you had to grab earlier in this draft than you would expect to have to get later on in, in a standard league? Yeah, I went with a guy later in the draft, so it's hard to know if this is going to actually turn out to be true because I think the more people dig into this guy, he might move up a little bit. But I'm talking about Seth Brown in Oakland. And the cool thing about the points format for these best balls, not only like Derek just mentioned, the batting average doesn't matter to me. Indirectly, the more hits, the better, but the the average itself doesn't matter directly. And the stolen bases do add up over time. So we don't specifically need the stolen base category, but his double digit steals add up. Also, Extra base hits that aren't home runs add up over time. Seth Brown had had more doubles than home runs to to pile on top in a point scoring format. I got him in the 20th round here and before pick 240. I, I don't think he'll be going that high in, in fab leagues when we get into it. I think he would be a few rounds later unless people are really buying into those stolen bases that we did talk about mid season at one point. It was <laughs> funny, but, but yeah, I, I like Seth Brown here and in this points format because uh, like Derek said with Schwarber and this is a, a cheaper guy later for some of the same reasons. Yeah. That batting average doesn't hurt me. I can't wait to see the tweets or the memes. There's like, why draft Kyle Schwarber in the fourth round when you can get Seth Brown in the 20th? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'd see right now. All right, let's, let's flip it over then. Kevin, I'll stick with you here. Talk to me about a player that you drafted You drafted here that you expect to have to pay up more so in a standard format. So this was difficult for me because I went hitters early in, in the first three rounds and, and then grabbed a few pitchers and, and then went back and got some players. But I'm going with my second round pick here. And it may not be as much to do with the format as I I think he's going to move up into the first round 
as we move along, maybe even in, in these best balls, this may be an outlier because he ended up overall for the season much better than I think people realize. And that's Bo Bichette. When he turned it on at the end of the season, I even in a five by five roto format, he ended up being a top 20 hitter on the season, which isn't bad for a first round pick. We're just trying to avoid landmines, right? We're, <laughs> it's very rare that you get or exceed value with a first round pick, but to have somebody that close is a success for a first round pick in my mind. And I think that he's going to end up there again. So getting him in the middle of the second round, and he's also one of these guys, when we start talking about how the rules changes are going to affect some of these players, he slowed down on stolen base attempts for a little bit because he has was being unsuccessful early in the season. This is a type of guy that we know in the past has had the opportunity to steal more bases. And if it's going to become easier, especially for a player like him that has done it before, I would fully expect him to take more of those opportunities with the new rules in place. And I really think he ends up being a first rounder when we get into the heart of draft season and getting him in the middle of the second. I, I don't think that'll happen much anymore. Yeah, you think, I'm assuming you think that he'll run enough. He'll actually be valued, even in this format, as we talked about, the stolen base is not as valuable on the fan tracks, best ball system with the points and whatnot, but just the difference in what he did last year to what you expect to do next year. They're not nothing. Stolen bases are worth some points. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. It can swing the other way. So, right. We don't specifically have to draft stolen bases. So that makes some of these guys, you don't have to get the power speed combos in the first round that so many fantasy players really want to start their drafts that way. Definitely in the first few rounds, I, pretty much everybody wants a, at least a couple of power speed combos or the guy's moderate power with a lot of stolen bases. But when you're when you start getting in that mindset that I don't have to have stolen bases, it can get really easy to forget that a, a stolen base is the same amount of points as a home run. So you're really looking at the combination. And if a guy's going to go 10, 10 home runs and 40 stolen bases and probably score more runs than the big power guy with the opposite being a 40-10 guy, you're probably going to score more runs, less RBIs. They can end up being approximately the same value. So you don't want to just completely discount stolen bases, which brings us back to the plug everything into a calculator or on a spreadsheet, figure out how these different categories do add up in the point system. So you have a Kyle Schwarber who goes like 50-10. It's not any different than a guy going 10-50 in with next year's stolen bases numbers expected to go up at least maybe across the board. We'll talk about that in a future episode as will everybody, I'm sure. It's interesting to see that exactly as that combination, especially especially when you know what the point structure is. And Kevin, you talk about this like every other episode <laughs> during the season. Know the rules of your league. Know the point structure. I've seen so many tweets. I don't think I've, I think I've only experienced this like once in a draft room where somebody actually goes, hey, what are the point? Like they have to actually ask in the chat what the point structure is. And so nobody will answer either. It's no, if you're really in this room right now and you don't, and you don't know, you can find out there are ways. <laughs> you Happy should to just, tell you after the draft. After the draft, yeah. Here's my, yeah, here's my, DM me after. Derek, who's the guy then that you drafted here that you would expect yep. to pay up more so in Slurf, for example? So, Cedric Mullins was the guy for me. So I took him at an overall pick 62. Now that's not incredibly low. He was, I think, in the main event last year, NFBC main event, which is just handy. He was around pick 40. That's only 20 spots. And he actually he was down compared to where he was the year before, but he was like pretty much in line with his projections. And my guess is, and this is just an uneducated guess, but my guess is he probably ends up being drafted pretty close to where he was last year based on the 34 steals because people are going to continue to value those. And in this best ball format, they're just, they're valuable in that they give you points, but they're not one fifth of your scoring as they are in Roto. And so they're certainly not, you don't have to worry about the scarcity of steals. So just like Bobachet, Cedric Mullins is a guy who is going to be more valued in a format where you steals you have to have as opposed to steals you might get. That makes sense. Yeah. And I think that you put that in a clear, concise way. It's like it's one each category in the Roto is one fifth of the points that you need to win right. your league. And then in the overall standing, as opposed to as Kevin was alluding to that 
you can mix and match your the statistics that you want because they're all going to give you points. And it's just a matter of what combination of points that you're looking to get throughout throughout the course of the season. Yeah, it's something to uh, some. It, it also matters on whether or not these guys are actually going to repeat these same numbers. So it's 34 steals. It doesn't necessarily mean he's going to hit that same number. And the same with pretty much anything that you're looking at, any statistic that any, especially counting stats that you're looking into. And these best balls are all counting stats. Everything, there's no, you don't get mm-hmm. points for average or OBP. You, we talk about those earlier on in the episode as just like a reference point to what goes into them. So obviously walks and hits matter more in the in an OBP style league, but the percentages don't matter per se. It's all about, like you said, Derek earlier, it's all about volume. I think that's good. I think those are a couple good players to keep in mind that in the difference that they're putting out there and what you're going to have to put into there as you're looking into these types of drafts. And I may have to do one of these. Just I think Derek, you might have you might have convinced me to dip my toe in the water. I told myself I was going to do less leagues next year. And I think this is like the loophole. I think this is like the loophole to say, all right, I'll do the same amount of leagues, but I'll transfer them to best balls and not have That's to right. No yep. guilt free. It's <laughs> like fat free sour cream. There's just, but it's no guilt. You can do as many as you want. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it works. That's my understanding. That's how it works. Yeah. And they're not as deep as the draft and hold 50 round leagues, but you're still getting close to 500 players deep when you do these drafts. And so I am sure. I'm 100% positive I'm not the only one that when they first start doing more draft and hold drafts because I don't have to worry about fab and then you get to end season and it's a little more work than you were counting on setting that lineup (laughs) twice a week, especially when you have multiple leagues, that this is the answer right here. Yeah, unless you get, quote, lucky and then half your roster is injured and then you don't have a choice to make on those lineup changes. Sometimes just, those decisions are made for you. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> I would also say it's a bit of a relationship saver. I don't know about you guys, but <laughs> during the summer, my my spouse is interested in doing things, going places, being out in public. Yes. And so it's, I'm going to check the stats no matter what, but I don't have to do anything about the stats. So son- it's, it, yes. Your Sundays are a little bit more stress-free than- Yes, um, that's correct. Yeah, than maybe us, who literally that's what we do on a weekly basis is talk about how we're going to be spending our Sundays. All right, let's close it up here. Kevin, this is the first off-season advice you have for- Do you have any at this point in the off-season in addition to everything we already talked about? Not really, but it's more than- It's a whole lot of fun. Derek said- Most people really enjoy drafting. So I think if people want to take time off from fantasy baseball, baseball, absolutely take some time off. But if you want to just do a little bit so that you don't get to February 1st and haven't done the research that last year in February, you said next year, I'm going to have already looked at some of this stuff jump in a best ball once in a while that they're slow drafts and it's an easy way to start looking at the player pool. And no, no matter how many drafts I do every draft I am in at some point, there's a pick that I'm like, I should have been considering that guy last round. And I didn't, why didn't I? And that's one of the huge things I get out of this. So it's a great time and it'll also help you get familiar with the player pool for next season. Yeah. And we will, we will be drafting soon. We'll be announcing our listener leagues by the very latest at by the end of the month, but probably within the next two weeks, we'll have a sign up sheet for all of the on the wire listener leagues. And so you can, if you want to get into those fab league drafts early on, Early and often, we will have them available for you. Kevin, I think you did your first Fab League last year was a main event qualifier, and I don't think you did that until December. So even remember- One of the first Fab Leagues that- That they even offered. Yeah. Yep. So I think that's our goal. I think our goal is to open up our first league before any NFBC Fab Leagues open up. So that'll be our unofficial goal here. I know that we can't do it until they turn the site over completely in November after uh, playoffs are over. So look for that coming forth. That's going to that's gonna do it for this episode. Derek, I want to thank you once again for rejoining us. As, we, as I realized before we recorded, you were our first guest of the 2022. 
two off season or leading in. And now you're our first guest heading into the 2023 off season. So this obviously has become an annual tradition for us. So we'll make sure we, <laughs> it would be nice to have you back on before the off season. We're nice to have you in the same spot. We'll pencil you in early October, early to mid October in 2023 as well. But can you let everybody know where, remind everybody where they can follow you, where they can find that Twitter, the Twitter feed where we talked about those differences, all the stuff sure. that you're working on and anything else that I'm missing? Absolutely. And I appreciate you guys having me on. I enjoy it. It's a nice way to start the off season. And I definitely have it in my calendar for 2023, October 2023. But yeah, you can find me on Twitter. My main account is at DRHOA3. And I'll do some fantasy baseball stuff there, but it's a lot of injury stuff. It's a lot of my work with baseball prospectus, which is all injury based. But then best ball specific content, which is at JAG, J-A-G, underscore fantasy. And that's where I, anything best ball, any research that I do, or if I'm posting best ball boards and stuff like that, it'll be there. And that thread is there. And as well as the best ball guide, the little sheet, the little info sheet that we referenced earlier, it's my pinned tweet. And if you're new to best ball, I think it's a good place to start. Certainly not the end all be all, but it's a place to start. And I'll be putting some stuff. I don't know if I'm gonna get to write much, but I'll get to add some stuff to the Twitter feed. So you can keep an eye out that uh, on that for the, the off season. Awesome. Make sure you guys are checking out that again. We'll have links to all that in the show description so you can check that out directly. And that is going to wrap it up for episode 81 of On The Wire. We will be back with weekly shows throughout the off season. So make sure those subscriptions are active, but make sure you are subscribing, sharing, and reviewing the podcast wherever you are listening. You can follow myself on the Twitter at 80 grade. That's all spelled out. Kevin is at Hasting Kevin. Of course, follow the pod itself at On The Wire Pod. Once again, thank our guest, Derek Rhodes, for joining us. He should be followed at both J-A-G underscore fantasy and at D-R-H-O-A-3. After all that, I am Adam Howe. And on behalf of Kevin Hastings, thanks for listening. We bid you goodbye. Goodbye.